could talk about Zigbee, or you could talk about Z-Wave, or you could talk about Bluetooth Mesh, and let's not forget just general purpose Wi-Fi. And that balkanization has created some real challenges for getting devices to be able to talk to each other, to unlock kind of the, the true potential of the smart home. From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Dave Finch. Today, amid a late afternoon Austin thunderstorm, we explore Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Bluetooth mesh networking for IoT applications. A few months ago, one of our All About Circuits community members reached out and asked us for a series of episodes on wireless connectivity protocols for IoT applications. We started with a deep dive into LoRaWAN and followed that up with an in-depth look at YSUN. And now, in our third installment of the series, we take a look at three very well-known technologies well-suited for home automation, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Bluetooth Mesh. My guest today is Ross Sibolsic. Ross is Vice President and General Manager of Industrial and Commercial IoT Products at Silicon Labs. Throughout his career, Ross has led engineering teams at National Instruments and Silicon Labs. Um, he has served on the board of directors at organizations such as Habitat for Humanity, Austin Dog Alliance, and the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, proving that if his career doesn't put mine to shame, then his personal commitment to community enrichment sure does. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind, Dave. <laughs> I, I aspire to be somebody who can accomplish all of these things, but I feel like I'm running out of time if I haven't done it already. Uh, so, you know, Ross, uh, for for almost two years, uh, you've been responsible for for P and L business development uh, and roadmap and new product development at Silicon Labs. This is that's really huge. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's real real fortunate to be in this position and. Uh, you know, I just consider myself blessed to be kind of at the epicenter of everything that's happening in the IoT at Silicon Labs. Yeah, epicenter is absolutely the the right word to use when you're talking about a company like Silicon Labs, uh, just because of the the portfolio that has been developed over the last couple of decades. And um, you know, I will uh, I will give a shout out right now to the weather pattern that seems to be in Austin. So. If our listeners are hearing lightning and thunder, um, not only is Ross making excellent points, uh, but we are intensifying those with the dramatic effect of uh, lightning and thunder. So yeah. uh, before we dive into the topic of Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Bluetooth Mesh, let's talk for a second um, a little more broadly about the smart home market. You know, it's a somewhat right. different animal than, say, smart buildings or smart construction, these sorts of... Uh, enterprise-focused, data-driven operational models. Uh, so what are the unique challenges uh, facing developers of smart home products? Yeah, so I think, great question, Dave. And, you know, if you take a look, take a step back and you look at the market, you know, the market's been evolving for, uh, you know, well over a decade, all the way back to the days where you could connect devices with wireline control if anybody has struggled with X10. Uh, you know that uh, smart home has been uh, a market that's been uh, targeted for a long time and to a large extent somewhat elusive based on, you know, having the right devices with the right communication protocols, talking to the right ecosystems and gateways. You know, pulling together a comprehensive smart home solution has really been a challenge. And you can see that today a little bit in there's been numerous technologies that have found certain niches within smart home and have done extremely well, mm -hmm. but have resulted in a bit of a balkanization. So, you, you know, you mentioned all the technologies. You could talk about Zigbee or you could talk about Z-Wave or you could talk about Bluetooth Mesh. And let's not forget just general purpose Wi-Fi. You know, there are devices that have been designed using those technologies because they were the right fit for that product. And that's great if all you want to do is have a thermostat in your house or, 
you know, a wireless sprinkler controller for your yard, something like that. But what we're seeing is, you know, customers, as you start getting integrated into the smart home, you really just expect and want your devices to work together. Mm -hmm. And that balkanization has created some real challenges for getting devices to to be able to talk to each other, to unlock kind of the, the true potential of the smart home. Right. And that that interoperability is is really the key. I mean, among all the challenges, of course, is this interoperability. And, you know, there's no shortage of high performance IoT connectivity protocols out there. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, you know, in prior episodes, we have examined uh, LoRa and right. Ysun, and each of these have their respective merits depending on the application. Where does Zigbee, Z-Wave, and even Bluetooth Mesh, where do these sit within the landscape of wireless connectivity for IoT? Yeah. So if you if you take a step back and look historically, you know um, we uh, you know we've acquired Z-Wave as a as an asset as a technology now we have in our portfolio, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the things we've done as part of that is we've opened it up. So now we're pushing Z-Wave as an open standard, where previously you know Z-Wave was really controlled by really one semiconductor supplier. Now we're we're trying to open that up. The reason. I, I think that's important is it put, puts a little context of where we're at today and sort of what the advantages all those technologies bring. Z-Wave is, you know, been around for uh, 10 years and the number of products that are out uh, available in the market for Z-Wave is pretty impressive. So you could pick almost any uh, IoT application you can think of, be it a thermostat or a light bulb or a a smart valve or a motion sensor, mm-hmm. and there's going to be multiple Z-Wave solutions for it, and they're all going to work together. So Z-Wave is really great for having a, a complete ecosystem that's been you know, being developed for 10 years. Mm-hmm. One of the challenges with Z-Wave was, as it had been in the past, a closed standard, uh, that, had, uh, that had, I don't want to go as far as to say scared off, but that that influenced some people's thoughts about it of wanting to be driven uh, or wanting to adopt a, a truly open standard. So we're addressing that with opening up Z-Wave, but uh, historically Z-Wave has not been uh, an open ecosystem in that way. Um, if you look at Zigbee, uh, Zigbee really has the benefits of starting with a clean sheet of paper and saying, if we wanted to build you know, the best wireless mesh network for low powered home devices. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zigbee was kind of started with a clean sheet of paper in that regard. Okay. So technically, you know, there's some really sophisticated aspects to Zigbee in terms of how the routing is done on the network or how to handle these use cases like sleepy end nodes that, um, you know, make it really compelling for that reason, but it has not had the same ecosystem, uh, I would say uh, completeness that Z-Wave has had. That's changing now. Uh, you know, after um, after several years of products in the market, there's a there's a really comprehensive Zigbee ecosystem as well. Sure. Um, if if you look at the two, though, one other big difference between them is Zigbee is runs at a 2.4 gigahertz, and of course, the advantage of running a 2.4 gigahertz is globally available spectrum. So you don't have to really do anything unique to sell a, a product worldwide. Right. Uh, the disadvantage of 2.4 is 2.4 can be kind of crowded. Uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, other things sit at 2.4. And uh, the range won't be quite as good as what you could get from a sub-gigahertz device. Right. So uh, meshing is real important in Zigbee. Z-Wave uh, is a sub-gigahertz protocol, so you can get better penetration through walls and buildings and uh, you know, generally better range without having to mesh as frequently. So uh, they, they complement each other in some ways as well because of the 2.4 and sub-gig aspects of it. Yeah, it's, it's excellent to have the portfolio that covers both. Um, right. And, uh, and so then, you know, Bluetooth kind of obviously is also at the the 2.4 gigahertz right. and um how how different is that from uh Zigbee? Yeah, so you know frequency frequency wise um you know Bluetooth is at 2.4 and if you if you look at why customers I guess just to give a little background 
one of the big attractions for Bluetooth is this idea that you have your your gateway or your your connection to the network readily available in your cell phone. So really attractive to be able to install a few light bulbs in your house and control them with your cell phone without having to add, say, a gateway to do it. So that, that's, that's a really big advantage that Bluetooth brings to the table. Uh, the Bluetooth standard has evolved now over time where there's Bluetooth mesh. Okay. And so Bluetooth mesh now lets you, instead of just being point to point from your phone to individual devices, now those devices can create their own mesh network so you can expand your coverage, but still have the ability to do this gateway-less operation to, uh, to connect to those devices. Um, you know, Bluetooth is a Bluetooth mesh is a standard is, uh, you know, really starting to take off in a couple of use cases. One of the real important use cases we see is this idea of almost a starter IoT product. So what I mean by that is you could look at some of the light bulb manufacturers and they'll now sell you uh, Bluetooth mesh light bulbs. Right. So if you're just kicking the tires and you want to put in two or three bulbs, you can try it. You don't have to pay for a gateway or get connected to the cloud and you can just control it from your phone. Uh, once the networks scale up in a large way, what some of those customers then or some of those uh, suppliers then do is say, hey, you need a, um, a more complete mesh and a gateway for getting these advanced features, switch over to Zigbee. For example, gotcha. Okay, so uh, lowering the barrier, we'll say, to entry for the user, um, right? Right. And uh, so, if if we start to look under the hood of these different technologies, um, you know, and we start to compare things like, obviously, none of these are very long range transmissions. I, I guess let me correct that. Z wave being sub gigahertz uh, would be right. longer range, but I think the use case of connected devices in the smart home setting, you know, we're not talking about having to go kilometers, you know, it's, it's one device to the next, uh, within the square footage of your home. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how do these, uh, compare to say, uh, power consumption and, um, you know, the battery life, that sort of thing. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, the one thing I would I would just add to your kind of characterization of not needing long range in the home, uh, that's true if you have a network that winds up being fairly dense. So, you know, if you have, let's say, dozens of bulbs in your home uh, and they're spread out throughout your house, then range really isn't a concern at all. But um, if you've built out a smart home, you'll always find there's this one light switch or this mm. one spot in the back of the house where, for whatever reason, it can't get to the it can't get to the mesh. Right, and uh, that's where range starts to matter. Gotcha. Um, in the okay. home, even even though it's you know you normally think of range as kilometers, it still is. It can be important in the home. Um, when we we talk about distance, you know, if it depends a lot on the construction. Uh, of the home. And it depends a lot about if you're trying to handle just applications inside your home or what we would call kind of end of property applications. Mm -hmm. So you want to have a sensor on the gate in the back of your yard and it's a pretty sparse mesh to get there because it's away from your home. You know, that's, that's really covers some of those distance needs in, in a home automation network. To that end, uh, if you look at our, our Z-Wave technology, uh, you know, Z-Wave is sub gigahertz, which helps to begin with. And we just announced a new uh, standard based on top of Z-Wave, which we call Z-Wave Long Range. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so this adds a new modulation scheme um, that allows you to have point-to-point uh, -point communications and uh, also to cover greater distances than you could with Z-Wave, uh, standard Z-Wave. And it's really that use case of I've got a light in my garage or that back gate or something like that where the network gets kind of sparse. The distance may be a few hundred feet, but you don't have a bunch of relay points between there to help you hop. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, I hadn't even considered that, uh, which speaks both to the square footage of my home and <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I, I see it in my case where I would want to 
if I were going to invest in, in kind of a smart setup, it would be so dense in here that I don't think anything would be going much farther than say 10 or 15 feet. <laughs> right, but, right. but that's not everybody's, especially when you think about aging in home, right? Like uh, for, uh, for people who want to set up kind of a, safer, more monitorable uh, sort of living arrangement for their parents or even for themselves, um, right. you can't assume that it's you're going to have this uh, device density. Right, right. Yeah. You, you'd ask the question about power consumption as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, that is um, that's one of the arts of, of, you know, trying to design these meshing networks is you have very different types of devices that are getting on the network. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a relatively simple one for power consumption is if you have something that's powered from the line, wall powered, mm -hmm. um, a light bulb, uh, a switch, uh, something, you know, like a, a light switch, uh, that you have this luxury of, you know, kind of almost within whatever the, uh, the uh, government regulations will allow, you almost have unlimited power. If you compare that with a door and window sensor where you wanted to operate off a coin cell battery, you know, that's a very different kind of scenario. So um, there's a lot of uh, features that have been added to the specifications to handle sleepy end nodes. Okay. And the idea of these are battery powered nodes that don't need to wake up very often, but you want them to have the longest possible battery life. So they're not allowed to, for example, route data from other nodes in your mesh because they don't, they're not always monitoring the mesh to be looking for messages, for example. Right. So that, that data, uh, that power consumption, really, there's specific node types and techniques you use to try to say, hey, this is a battery-powered end node. It's sleepy. It's predominantly just going to wake up and transmit when it has something to say. Um, and those are kind of some of the ways you can, you can uh, optimize and extend your battery life. Gotcha. Okay. And by the way, I, I just, I have this comical picture in my mind of, the node that's part of a mesh that says, don't bother me. Like I'm only, <laughs> <laughs> I'm only here for self-serving purposes. Um, it's a, it's a conversational diode. <laughs> I can talk, but don't bother talking to me. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> I've been accused of the same. Um, <laughs> that's how I got my Asperger's diagnosis. <laughs> um, you know, our listeners know that I'm an audio engineer, definitely not um, an RF engineer. And you can even tell by the questions that I have to ask when I'm talking RF with anybody. Um, sure. So if you'll indulge me this question, if if you're a designer um, and you've got a system on chip uh, that incorporates, okay, your your processor. In this case, let's say it's one of Silicon Labs' Gecko things where you've got um, mm -hmm. you've got an ARM, a decent ARM Cortex. I believe M33 um, is yeah. what you currently have in there. Correct. And then also in the same sort of uh, module or system, you've got power management, analog, you've got the physical radio. And right. I presume that by integrating all of this by one manufacturer and a manufacturer who has sort of a legacy and, and a lot of IP around power, ultra low power and um, uh, signal processing and also, um, you know, wireless connectivity. I, I would assume that the advantages here uh, with respect to the system might be perhaps this thing self-regulating the transmit power, whether it's based on RSSI or current draw or even the application that it's running and what it has to be doing at the moment. Is this correct or am I oversimplifying things? Uh, I think, you know, if you look at um, in particular with the radios, um, you know, there, there are some things we, we can do on the radios to try to monitor um, power to see if, how close you are to, let's say, the gateway and possibly backing off your power because you see, you know, you get a very strong signal for the gateway. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it uh, is tied into, for, you know, when we talk about battery consumption, that's that's really the, the customer pain point that is just right in front of your face. Mm, um, okay. You know, I, I have, let's say in my house, six motion sensors. If I have to change those batteries every six months, that's a real hassle for me right. as, as a consumer. <laughs> yes. Um, 
So, uh, you know, if you can make that be three years instead of six months, that's a huge win for, for the use case. So a lot of, uh, a lot of what we do is focus on that, those low power, um, kind of battery operated modes. And there's, you know, there's several things you can do there. We talked about some of the things you do in the network to try to make, design these devices to only wake up when they have to send data. So if you think of like a door and window sensor, you can run in a very low power mode where maybe all you're looking for is the Hall effect sensor to trigger mm -hmm. that the door is opened. So you can do that as a really low power state for your MCU. You have your radio shut off. You know, you're, you're operating the core in as low of a mode as possible. You can detect in that low power mode that this sensor has transitioned, that, you know, the door opened. Now you wake up, you, you know, read whatever you need to read from the sensor, you broadcast whatever you need to broadcast back to the gateway, and then you can go back to sleep. So uh, okay. that, that overall power management there is, is, is kind of tied a lot of times to trying to maximize that battery life. Trying to do, try to operate in a low power mode that does just enough for you to sense your environment and nothing more. Hey, everybody, it's Dave. Uh, in case you missed it, All About Circuits just concluded its inaugural Industry Tech Days virtual trade show and conference last week. Over 25,000 visitors came to check out live sessions, digital booths, and hundreds of videos and white papers. Personally, I had a great time emceeing the uh, headline keynote sessions, and you can hear me chat with some of the industry's most interesting leading figures across five hour-long sessions. Learn about real-time edge processing with Richard Berry, founder of Free RTOS and senior principal engineer at Amazon Web Services. Hear the founder of edX, Professor Anant Agarwal, explain why the future of engineering education is online and available to all. Watch me fulfill a lifelong dream of hanging out with a professional race car driver as we learn about autonomous electrical vehicle racing with Lucas Degrassi and Bryn Balcom of RoboRace. Catch up on the emerging super trend of autonomous robotics with Qualcomm's Dev Singh. And hear three top minds in the distribution and manufacturing services world comparing notes about how COVID-19 has disrupted our supply chains, perhaps forever. Each keynote is available on demand now at All About Circuits. Check out this episode's page on allaboutcircuits.com for direct links or head to the Industry Tech Days link in the Explore tab. Now, uh, security. So regarding security, right? obviously, this is a design imperative for any connected device. And, you know, it's important to all of us, really, because realistically, you know, your personal data, my personal data, my, my dog's personal data, it'll all be landing temporarily on some consumer grade silicon, you know, with right. maybe even an Alexa API running next to it. You know, whether it's from Silicon Labs or one of your competitors, uh, my understanding of how Silicon Labs is addressing security at the device level, uh, at the hardware level, is you're starting all the way back at like the bootloader. And um, you right. even got things where now you can toggle the lock, unlock on certain vulnerable ports. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So if, if you, uh, yes. So security. Uh, definitely is becoming, you know, mission critical uh, across all of our IoT applications. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of what you brought up, if you if you think of a developer who's creating a device, uh, there's there's some there's kind of a developer's journey you go through, where uh, things you want to do when you're prototyping the device, like I want it to be real easy to debug and download you know, a new firmware in, image is things you definitely don't want when you deploy this into the field. <laughs> so right. you don't want anybody to just say, hey, here's some random firmware <laughs> to download. Maybe I, I was just made aware by my kids, there's this whole subculture of it runs Doom. So trying to get the, you know, the classic first-person <laughs> shooter game, Doom, to run on just crazy hardware like a printer <laughs> or an ATM. So uh, unless you want to make your products your light bulb, see if it can run Doom. Uh, you, do, you don't want people in the field, you know, hacking your hardware with uh, with uh, with just random code. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that you have a debug port typically where you can download code and you can sniff what's going on. And that's great when you're developing. Mm -hmm. But now you want to ship it out into the field and you want to lock that port down. So we have the ability. We've always had the, well, not always. Many of our devices have had the ability to lock that port. So that's great. But the problem is now if you have a customer that says, hey, my device got bricked. Mm -hmm. Help me debug it. You can't do anything because right. all of that uh, ability to sniff and see what's going on is, is locked. So with our new parts, you know, we allow the ability for a customer to lock that port using a using a secure key, and then if the customer sends it back, they have this you know private key they can use to unlock it. For example, so you know that gives you the security in the field, but also this ability to uh, you know support returns. So that's that's the first step in the journey. You know, the other thing you want to ensure is that somebody has not tampered with the code that you're using to boot the device. So the lowest level code. And so we have, uh, you know, what we call root of trust is secure boot. So that code can't be modified. And then you can actually uh, use it to verify that you have signed code that's legitimate because you have a secret key as a manufacturer you use to sign your code. So we can do that as, as well to make sure that, um, you know, only, only genuine code is being run. When it's time to upgrade in the field, you can sign your firmware image. The device can verify that this is truly from you and allow that code to be upgraded, but not other code. So those are some features we have as well. And then if you look beyond uh, those sort of uh, tampering attacks, you know, we have additional um, security built in. So... I was really shocked to see how inexpensive it's gone, it's become to run these uh, differential power analysis attacks. And I don't I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but no. Can you explain that? Yeah. So what what you can do is if you can get physical access to the device, and you know if I'm a hacker, I try to go in through this port that's now been locked. Mm -hmm. How can I figure out maybe what your secret keys or your passwords are in the device? Right. So um, there's a technique where you can measure the current consumption on the power supplies to the chip. And by uh, trying to get the part to boot up over and over again, or even trying to inject certain faults into the part, you can measure the power on the pin and you can actually figure out what code is running inside the device. Okay. Oh my gosh. So it sounds super sophisticated, but you can actually get hardware on the web for a few hundred bucks that would let you run a pretty sophisticated power attack like this. Yeah. Um, so we have other protection mechanisms like um, we call it's called DPA differential power attack. So we put some countermeasures in where we actually uh, inject noise intentionally onto the power supply. So you can't see what's going on underneath. Nice. Nice. That's, and then it, go ahead. I was going to say, if you go, so that, that sort of secures the physical device. And then if you go up from a level above that, now you need to secure maybe the network that's running on the device. So great. I can, I can ensure that it's a genuine Silicon Labs device. It's my software running on it. I'm going to start, uh, you know, spitting out Zigbee packets. Um, those protocols have um, keys that they need to exchange and use. And you have to store those keys within your device. And now you want to make sure that these keys you're using in your protocol are, are secured and people can't tamper with them. Right. So we have features that allow you to encrypt the key in a, in a device-specific way. It's almost like the device has a fingerprint that it uses to sign the key that is totally unique to that device. And uh, if someone tries to swap that key out without this fingerprint, you know, you can detect it. So you can then kind of secure it also at this uh, at the protocol level by storing the secrets you need to be able to store, you know, to run a given protocol. So is this is this layer sort of native to say Zigbee or Z-Wave, or is this something where if Philips comes along, they say, "Oh, our new line of Hue light bulbs is going to have these different security features," that Philips then has to go and figure out this, uh, you know, how to manage this. Yeah, the, the protocols will have uh, different um, keys in them to ensure that you have, uh, you know, a secure channel. Okay. Uh, you could on top of that add on top of that protocol saying, you know, 
um, you know, I've secured the channel. You may want to further secure the data you're pumping through that channel and encrypt that or, you know, uh, have other things you're building for your entire system on top of it that we wouldn't supply. That could become more vendor specific. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you think about, you know, if you have a, a, a light bulb that's connected to your phone, you want that to be secure all the way up to the cloud. Sure. So uh, there's, you know, some of those protocols we don't get into. Those are built on top of this underlying kind of data pipe we create. Um, but for the data pipe, we provide uh, the, the hardware and the, the capabilities to secure that data pipe. Yeah. And that's, you know, re <laughs> within reason that that seems to make sense that all a semiconductor manufacturer should be responsible for is just get us a very clean pipeline. And, you know, it's on us then to build um, a secure application around that. Right. Right. Um, so. Wow, that's now I'm just curious, like how many different ways are there to to break into a chip? Um, but <laughs> I guess that's a different episode for a different day. Um, if a uh, if an engineer uh, would decide to use, um, you know, we'll say like a system on chip or a module um, to build a Zigbee or Z-Wave, um, you know, connected product mm -hmm. outside of um, the system on chip. What should they prepare to be able to design, whether it's antennas or, you know, even the interface and timing uh, stuff that goes around the module? Yeah, I think that, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at the options you have available to you, you can buy one of our SOCs, you can get all of our design collateral and you can spin your own board, design your own antenna, you know, totally, totally choose your own adventure. Um, and, but if you're trying to quickly prototype something or, you know, you think you're in a situation where I'll maybe only have, I'll maybe only sell 10,000 of these devices a year. So I don't want to just, I need to get to market quick. Um, you know, I'm not trying to squeeze every last penny out of my design. You can choose a module. And, you know, one of the big advantages the modules have are, uh, on the RF side. Mm -hmm. So when you decide you want to ship your product to the U S the FCC has to say, yep, your product is legal to ship to the U S right. Uh, going through that certification can be cumbersome, uh, particularly if that's not, you know, if you're trying to rapidly prototype and you're not a, you know, large, uh, large consumer electronics company, uh, you may want to just say, I don't want to deal with it. So a module brings a lot of advantages in that we will pre-certify, let's say, a Zigbee module, and you can buy it and drop it in your product, and you can reuse all those certifications by virtue of having a module. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a, a huge help in trying to get you know time to market. So so the RF, you know, normally what my experience has been is where customers will struggle a lot is on that RF design and a module can help you immensely on that front. Sure. So the RF is a big component of it. The power management's a big component of it. And then all of your IO, depending on what you're trying to do, you'll typically have some signal conditioning or some buffering between your IO to really be able to interface to it. Gotcha. Well, Ross, this has been, uh, such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. I know this, this is a busy week, uh, for you, especially. So, um, Silicon labs is hope hosting a, a pretty major online event this week. Yeah. 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 So we have our, our works with conference. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as part of the, uh, you know, the new reality, uh, that we're in with, uh, sort of this post COVID or this this in, in right in the midst of COVID world. Yeah. Uh, this has all gone virtual. So it's a two-day event. It, it started today on the 9th. It runs through tomorrow on the 10th. Uh, we have uh, panel sessions with uh, leading industry experts from you know, Google or Amazon or you know, ADT uh, talking about applications for smart homes, kind of what's happening with the market. And we also have developer tracks going on that if you want to learn about uh, pursuant to our earlier conversation, how to build a battery powered, you know, IOT node, we have, uh, you know, deep dive sessions about these considerations we've talked about. How do you put the part to sleep? What's the right low power uh, mode to use? So it's really, uh, uh, we think a great uh, event for the industry. 
uh, 5,000 people signed up. So uh, oh, wow. it's been pretty exciting to see. And, uh, you know, we think it's uh, it will kickstart a lot of activity around, uh, you know, a whole new generation of uh, smart home products. You know, I, I'm all about these live events, these online events, because um, I just, like you said, kickstarting. It, it feels more like a starting point to um, uh, a design that you might be undertaking. For example, um, I was looking at your uh, uh, your technical tracks and it's it's like, all right, cool. I can I can go and learn about. Um, Amazon Common Software, right, and and right. Um, implementing Alexa gadgets, uh, whatever call it a stack or whatever you know they've uh, whatever they've got available uh, for my application, but um, it feels much more like a springboard than a destination. You know, I get so much more out of these sessions, these technical sessions, when I can go back and listen to a presentation or you know um, pause, look something up if I don't understand it in real time, and you know all about circuits. Uh, they just wrapped up their huge week-long industry tech days online event last week and mm-hmm. um similarly to to silicon labs you know what i noticed about your schedule is um uh you also have all these really heavy hitters amazon google um i think i saw samsung in there if i'm not mistaken yeah. mm-hmm. um and, and a bunch of others all kind of under one roof so how is how do you perceive silicon labs uh playing this role in sort of encouraging industry collaboration especially uh in the smart home arena over the past few years yeah great question i think uh you know if you look uh i don't if, if you have if you've seen our ceo talk about iot you know he it's really been a driving vision for him mm-hmm. for you know uh over six years now, and even prior to him, that we were going to be, we wanted to be the premier company uh, in IoT. Mm-hmm. And if you look at our portfolio, you know, we've been building out this portfolio of all these wireless connectivity technologies, Z-Wave, Zigbee, Thread, Bluetooth, right. Bluetooth Mesh, Wi-Fi, uh, even proprietary sub-gigahertz radios, where we think we're the only player in the industry that can offer you whatever technology you want or need for your given application. So, you know, we're, we're, we see ourselves a lot as impartial brokers. You know, it's not that we only have Z-Wave, so every problem is, has to be solved by Z-Wave. Right. Um, you know, hey, I, I got them all. Pick, you know, as long as you buy it from me, it's <laughs> right. just, just buy something. Uh, I think that helps a lot in us having credibility and also being in a unique position, really, to uh, to unify those all those standards together in a way that they just work. Right. And I think that's what allows us to you know draw upon these different industry uh, leaders is the fact that we truly do have a comprehensive portfolio and we truly do want to see it all work because we have it all and we think the best way to grow the industry is to you know drive better interoperability. I used this phrase last week during one of the technical sessions. It's this, this, the idea of the rising tide, right? That lifts all the ships when, right. Oh, that's, uh, it's cool to be in that position. You know, um, we've uh, enough preaching from me. We've, we've got about, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got about two more minutes. Uh, and I wonder if you'll indulge me in a new segment we're introducing to Moore's lobby. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're calling it the ESD round, very much like a lightning round. Um, all right. But it's for, <laughs> engineers although today i guess with the weather in austin we could we could very well call it the lightning round i'll put my grounding strap on okay (laughs) that's right this would be the only time in uh, interview history where a guest electrocuted himself (laughs) all right so um oh i also have some uh, theme music for this that uh oh okay that we dreamt up (laughs) 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 wow okay Uh, uh, hit me this is Let's great. do it. All right, cool. Uh, so you get the idea. I'll fire off uh, five simple questions, and you can answer however you wish. Uh, the uh, The first two have to do with personal preference, so there's no wrong answer. Okay. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, number one, just to ease into this a little bit, Austin in July or Boston in January? Ooh, uh, Austin in July. I'm with you. And by the way, um, I know you know Texas gets very hot. Uh, but um, Boston, city of Boston, is on official notice. If you want tourism, you know you got to fix your Januaries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, number two, oh, th- I like this one: Penn State or University of Texas? 
Oh, <laughs> oh, you don't have Dave, to answer. That's, that's not fair. I'm going to have, you know, I, uh, <laughs> my son is going to UT, so I, I, I have to go with UT. All right. Hey, that's a very, is he there in Austin or Denton? Where is he? He's, he's in my, uh, he's in the uh, living room right now, oh. uh, taking all of his classes from home. Beautiful. So yeah, so he's here. Ah, uh, very cool. Um, all right, good. Oh, I guess Denton is North Texas. Sorry. I, I yeah. 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 Um, UT is here actually in Austin, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, welcome. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay. Number three, this one actually is pertinent to something. Uh, what is your, what is your outlook personally on the future of smart home? Uh, incredibly bright. I think, uh, hmm. we've, we've got all the technology in place, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess it's a lightning round. So the underlying technology is present. There's forces in the market that I think are, are forcing a better interoperability. And I think that's just going to unleash the market. That is, uh, that is excellent. Um, I'll try to respect the, the boundaries of lightning round. I, I want to know more about that, but uh, we're almost <laughs> out of time. Um, so what do, okay, here's another one that's pertinent. What do people not know about Silicon Labs that uh, perhaps maybe they should? Wow, don't know about us. Um, that uh, you know, we're we're passionate about uh, bringing the IoT to the masses. I mean, that's really that that's you know they learn it, love it, live it. Uh, that's that's really what we're all about. All right, uh, number five. Oh, so all right, this is our last one. Um, uh -oh. This too is a matter of yeah, the high, stakes are high on this one. Uh oh. Uh, it's also a matter of personal preference, but I do have a feeling that there is in fact a wrong answer. Uh, this seems like a very divisive issue. Franklin barbecue or blacks? Oh, I'm Terry blacks, Terry blacks. Um, You've heard it here. I've, I've had them both. And, uh, to choose between waiting in line for, you know, two hours to get my barbecue and being able to walk up and get probably the best moist brisket I've ever had. I, I got to go Terry blacks. Yep. All right. I, uh, again, I'm with you on that one. I, I'm no expert. Uh, see, great minds think alike, Dave. <laughs> That's right. Well, one great mind and one dopey podcast <laughs> host, but uh, I'll take it. No, this has been really good. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, oh, let me play us out. I'm going to play the music here uh, for the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ross, so much. Thanks for joining us on such a busy week. And this has been um, a, a terrific uh, sort of overview of these different connectivity technologies and man on every one of these topics i feel like i've got 50 more follow-up questions oh well i'm happy to talk again dave i've enjoyed it and uh you know maybe we can talk in person and then uh, you know play some funk afterwards so nano funk <laughs> nano nano funk yeah, that's right <laughs> cool well you're my favorite bass player in austin i give you that uh <laughs> and uh have a great event and hopefully we get you back on the show again Sounds great, Dave. Hey, it's my pleasure, and uh, and have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks so much, Ross. All right. All right. Before I risk uh, getting COVID to catch the next flight to Austin for some barbecue from both Terry Black's and Franklin's, I want to express a sincere thanks to Ross Sabolsik from Silicon Labs for braving the weather and joining me live from his home in Austin, Texas. And as always, I want to hear from you. What do you think of these wireless protocols? Have you worked with Zigbee, Z-Wave, or Bluetooth yet? We want to hear your experiences, so drop your thoughts into the comments section on this episode's page on allaboutcircuits.com, or you can always message me on LinkedIn. And if you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to write us a review on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us. It's a small gesture, but one that goes a surprisingly long way in helping us to build a meaningful community of listeners and contributors. Thanks for listening. <laughs>